introduction and cover a couple housekeeping details before we get started with Justin. I'm Michelle DeRussia, the Communication and Events Coordinator for the Statewide Arboretum. Um, and most of you are probably familiar with us and what we do, but for anyone who's not or is new here today, we are a nonprofit organization with a mission to plant Nebraska for healthy people, vibrant communities. Oh, I'm gonna hit record, hold on. Oh no, it's recording. Oh yay, thanks Hannah. See, I told you I was gonna forget every single time. Yeah. Uh, mission to plant Nebraska for healthy people, vibrant communities and a resilient environment. And we do this all across <laughs> Nebraska through tree planting, garden making and environmental and education, education and outreach, just like these winter plant talks. We're also a member organization which means our work is funded in part by donations from regular people who value sustainable landscaping. So if you're not a member of NSA already, we would love for you to consider becoming one. And you can find out more about our different membership levels and benefits and all the good stuff at our website, which is plantnebraska.org. And we will put that in the chat, um, that link in the chat in a minute. So we have four more winter plant talk webinars coming up this winter that you might want to register for if you haven't already. The next one is actually scheduled for next Thursday, January 11th, and it'll be with Justin and Sarah Buckley, and they'll be talking about water-wise landscapes. So you can find out more about all of our winter plant talks and register for any of the ones that you want to attend at plantnebraska.org backslash plant dash talks and I will add that to the chat in a minute. Um, and also just so you know, we will be recording all of our plant talks and I'll send out a link to the recording by the end of the day via email. So even if you can't attend in person, we will um, send out a recording so you can watch it on YouTube at your leisure. So that's pretty much all my housekeeping details. Um, we're gonna get started on today's topic. So we give just enough time. Justin Evertson is Green Infrastructure Coordinator for the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum and the Nebraska Forest Service. Probably lots of you already know Justin. He is a legend around here and he knows more about trees probably than I have lifetime left to learn about. He's gonna talk about appreciating trees in the barren winter landscape that we have going on right now. And he's gonna offer us some tips on how to do tree identification during the winter when most trees have no leaves on their branches. And so that's kind of a deal breaker for me personally, without leaves, like I'm, I, I cannot tell a tree from anything. So he's gonna help us with that. So Justin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you for uh, for that great introduction, Michelle. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Michelle? All right, yep, I can hear you. Yep, you saw good. a lot of people spit their drinks out when you said he's a legend. And I can see my brothers rolling their eyes. But anyhow, I'll take it, Michelle. I appreciate that. I love trees. I love talking about trees. And even in the cold of winter, I think trees are pretty cool. So we're going to have a little fun here for about an hour just talking about trees and highlighting some things that I think are fun to share, even in the heart of winter when it's cold and we don't always want to be outside. So uh, let's do it. It probably won't be an hour, actually. I'm thinking maybe 30 minutes of presentation. It would be fun at the end if people would share, uh, not be too shy and be afraid, not be afraid to share some of their fun thoughts about winter trees too. So, and then also I'll let everybody know, uh, Graham Herbst, I see you're on the line here. Uh, we will do, we'll put up a form at the end for those of you seeking CEUs for Arboriculture, ISA, or the Nebraska Arborists Association, we will have a form for you. So just stay online at the end and you'll get some CEUs. Right, Graham? Yep, if I screw that up, Graham's here to fix it. So <laughs> we'll do that at the end. Also, now that I see over 100 people are on here, I'm quite nervous. So if I faint and fall over, Michelle, you'll have to pick this up. But I had no idea we'd have uh, this kind of interest in it. So uh, I think that's outstanding. Thank you all for joining and being a part of this. Okay, let's shut up and look at trees. I got to share my screen. I hopefully will do this right. Um, I'm out of form with uh, Zoom. So if I miss something, chime in. 
Michelle and, and wake me up. But can everybody see that screen? Winter tree appreciation yep. and ID. Yep, it's there. You're good. All right. We're off to a good start. I've got a laser pointer ready to show you the things that I think are cool about trees. Here in the heart of winter, we can still love and appreciate trees. Winter can be drab and foreboding for sure, especially when we're out here in the Great Plains. Um, I, Michelle hinted at this, the weather here the last couple of days has been cloudy and cold, kind of damp. Our snow is gone. And so it's not really uh, <laughs> fun to be outside right now. And this is kind of what we can think of uh, winter being sometimes. Here's a picture on East Campus and I thought this it reminds me of one of my favorite songs from the Mamas and the Papas, California Dreamin'. I see Bruce Hoffman on here. He probably grew up with this song. I won't sing it for you, but all the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. I've been for a walk on a winter's day. Kind of foreboding, right? But hey, winter can be pretty darn cool if you ask me. And if we look at it right, it can be glorious even in our part of the world. We were fortunate here in eastern Nebraska, and I think much of the state got a snow at Christmas time, and didn't that just make everything seem a little brighter and more cheery? I'm going to throw in a few quotes as we go along here, things that just maybe sing a little different note about winter. Here's a quote from Lewis Carroll and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I wonder if the snow loves the trees and fields that it kisses them so gently and then it covers them up snug, you know, with a white quilt. And perhaps it says, go to sleep, darlings, till summer comes again. I should have pointed out that's a picture from Wayne Park in Waverly. The last moisture we had in 2012, a March snowstorm, and <laughs> it didn't rain the rest of the year. Winter is a great time to bark up a tree. I apologize for that. Uh, a little bit of this funny humor I'll put in here. This is not, uh, this is what we would call four-year-old humor for my four-year-old grandson. But look at this rough bark. Winter is a great time to appreciate trees and really check out the bark. And we're gonna look at several trees and their bark today. But you have some trees with really cool rough bark like black oak on the left, hackberry in the middle and persimmon on the right. That persimmon, when you see an old persimmon, it looks like the back of an alligator. And if we were in Florida, we might have the two confused. Some trees have smooth bark. Some of these are not real common in Nebraska, but they all can grow here. The tree on the left is yellow wood. Then we've got a zelkova. I just took this picture yesterday out in front of Forestry Hall, a big old zelkova. Both of those trees look like elephant legs, don't they? They're so smooth. The beech in the upper middle and then carpinus or hornbeam on the lower right. Some trees have mottled bark. Sycamore, of course, is uh, almost really easy to love in winter. We grow a tree called lace bark pine here in the middle. And then there's a tree called lace bark elm that works for us in uh, Eastern and Southern Nebraska. Also a beautifully barked tree. And who wouldn't love trees with this peeling, exfoliating bark like uh, paper bark maple, free flower maple, which is a cousin of that in the middle. And then the pecan lilac can have a really fun bark, almost cherry-like. Other uh, trees with peeling bark include river birch on the left, uh, paper birch in the middle, which is a Nebraska native up on the Niobrara River Valley. Uh, it's actually fading in our land, native landscape because of climate change. So get out and enjoy uh, the paper birch while we can, and then uh, Quercus bicolor is swamp white oak on the right. That's uh, low, young twigs and uh, young bark has this very peeling nature to it. <clears throat> if you look close, even some trees will uh, really show off some funny twigs too, or some interesting twigs, and several of them are quirky. Sweet gum, some trees of sweet gum have this nature where they get winged stems. The rock elm in the lower middle, which is a native tree to eastern Nebraska, has these winged stems. And then boy, bur oak is the one that we really think of with corky winged bark on uh, young branches. Here's another good quote. When the winter tree is a snowflake dressed with grace and bones, a simple miracle to behold on winter's lonely road. 
that's Angie Weiland Cros Crosby. And those are trees I took a picture of from that same snowstorm in Waverly Wayne Park, a bur oak. Look at that, how beautiful that tree is in a dusting of snow. Then we can look at interesting twigs and buds. Just get out there, pay attention and look. And the twigs of trees are so different from each other if we bother to look. Up on the upper left is American beech, not a real common tree for us, but very common in the Eastern US. And then our European beech also looks very similar. Look how long and pointed those buds are. Nothing else is like that. On the upper right is a tulip tree. And if you see a bud, the uh, end tip bud that looks like a platypus's beak, that's a, uh, definitely the tulip tree. On the lower left is ginkgo. The neat thing about ginkgo is it tells you its age by its buds because it puts a new layer down every year and the leaves emerge uh, in a clump from the tip of that bud. So a bud that's 100 years old on a ginkgo could be several inches long. And then the lower right is blue ash. Can you see why they call that tree? Uh, the Latin name is Fraxinus quadrangulata. The four angled stems of the twigs are really prominent in the winter. Buds and leaf scars uh, can tell us what trees are. And if we look closely, we get to see the differences. Here on the far left are buckeye and horse chestnut, closely related trees. But if you see a horse chestnut, it has a very sticky, shiny paired bud at the tip of its twigs, unlike our native buckeye, which is uh, more fuzzy. On the right are two types of maple. The sugar maple is sharp and pointed. If you poked your brother with it, you might draw some blood. So don't do that. Be careful. Be nice to your brothers, even if they weren't nice to you. And then red maple on the right, you can see why uh, it gets its name red maple. There's a lot of red going on in the red maple. Red flowers, red buds, and even a red fall color. So it's an appropriate name for red maple. Look at these buds and these leaf scars. On the left is red oak. All of the oaks end in this uh, nice little bunch of buds at the tip of the branches. So there's usually four or five bunched up right together at the branch tips, and that gives away oaks pretty prominently. They're all a little different from each other, but we know that's a type of oak. Black walnut is this next tree. Do you see the monkey face in it that I do? The fuzzy nature of the branch and then the monkey face looking at us from the leaf scar that came off when the leaves fell. On the right are two ash trees, the two most common ash trees we have, white ash and green ash. The white ash, if you look at that bud scar, it is really smiling at us. It's got a C-shaped, moon-shaped uh, scar, and it's smiling at us. The uh, green ash on the right is generally more D-shaped uh, and not as quite as curved. Fruits and seeds can show up in the winter and be very prominent. There's just a real uh, sampling of some of them that we'll see that are prominent. Kentucky coffee tree, plane tree or sycamore up here in the middle. Uh, we could give you a quiz or a little clue about what do you think that is, a plane tree or a sycamore? We know that's a plane tree because when uh, the fruit balls end in a, a pair, those happen on plane trees. If they're individuals, they're going to be the sycamore. And you remember that by plane tree plural, sycamore single. See, you've already learned something today. It was worth the price of admission. Okay, then we've got that spiny seed ball that is the sweet gum. We've got linden uh, fruits hanging on in the winter. Tulip trees, the seeds actually mimic what the flowers looked like earlier in the year. Lower right is the box elder maple tree. And then on the far right are those long seed pods of the catalpa, sometimes called the cigar tree. Our conifer fruits too are real prominent in the winter. It could be anything from the blueberries of the red cedar, the Douglas fir cone, white spruce and Colorado spruce cones, Austrian pine and ponderosa pine cones, and then the con color fir. We'll talk more about fir in a minute, but you will not find these cones on the ground because they come apart on the tree. What good is the warmth of summer without the cold of winter to give it its sweetness, John Steinbeck? This is a grove of ponderosa pines that were um, behind this property in Waverly. I took a picture several years ago. For some reason, our school district took all those trees out. 
uh, in the last year, and it really changed that scene. I would have put up a real fuss if I lived here. <laughs> so what can be wonderful can all, also be lost when we think about our trees, and we got to do more to preserve them in our communities. Winter flower structures. We don't think of winter as the time for flowers, but boy, the flowers have to be ready going into winter. The buds at least do uh, if we're going to have flowers the next spring. And we can especially appreciate catkins in the winter, ironwood, birch, and cottonwood. And then on the right is magnolia flower bud. A lot of the magnolias, the pussy willows have very fuzzy, fun buds to look at in the winter. We're not going to go into any deep detail about tree ID today. Normally, when we do winter tree ID, this is a half day to a full day workshop. We don't have time for that. But what I thought I'd throw at you, do come join us. We will do some winter tree IDs in deeper detail later in, the, in February, and you'll get information about that. If you want to sit in on a whole day of it, these are the things we're going to cover. We'll look at the overall plant habit, size, and form of the trees. After a while, you'll get good at this and you'll say from a distance, oh, that's a cottonwood, that's a linden, that's an oak. You'll get pretty good at that after a while, I promise you. Uh, what's the shape and form of the tree and outline? What's the bark texture like, patterns and colors? We look at buds and leaf scars. We look at fruits, twig configurations and all kinds of things. And then we think about the tree in the landscape. If you happen upon it in the native woods and it's a low wet area, there's going to be a population of a certain type of tree that lives there as opposed to up on the slope. So context is really important to tree ID. We're not going to get into any of that in great detail today, but I will throw at you, just keep this in, in mind as you're out looking at your trees in the winter and you want to hone in on tree ID. The, almost the first thing I always think of is what are the bud arrangements and the branch arrangements. Are they opposite or alternate? So some trees are prominently opposite with their buds and twigs on the branch. Those are maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye, also lilac and viburnum. Most of the rest are alternate, although catalpa is whorled. And these two concepts really play an important role in trying to help identify trees throughout the year, but especially in the winter. If we think of this acronym, MADBUCK, just keep this in your mind and you'll have the uh, trees most prominently with opposite buds in your head. Maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye. If we were in Europe, they would say horse chestnut, so they probably remember mad horse, but they're crazy over in Europe, so let's remember mad buck. And then remember that uh, viburnums and lilacs are also opposite, so every so often you'll run into something like that. Here's another prominent thing to keep in your head as you're identifying trees in the winter, the concept of marcescent leaves. If leaves, uh, deciduous leaves are dried and brown and holding onto that tree, we call those leaves marcescent. And many species, well, several species are really strongly marcescent, and especially the oaks, and especially shingle oak and sawtooth oak are really prominent here. But other oaks do this, especially when they're young, like black oak, uh, swamp white oak is strongly that way, pin oak is strongly that way. And especially when they're young, the experts, the botanical experts think that there's an evolutionary advantage, especially with oaks. When they held those shrived, dribbled leaves tight to themselves early in their lives, it kept browsing away a little bit more so that the oak tree had a chance to get up before it got chewed off. Other trees do a little bit of this as well, like beech, sugar maple, ironwood, hornbeam, and viburnum. And then check the ground around the tree. If you're saying, oh, I'm not exactly sure what that is, look at the ground around it. If it was an oak tree, there's going to be some leaves hanging around below it somewhere, and some other leaves might be prominent, sugar maple, for example, or it might be a pine cone, or it might be some remnants of seeds and fruits That'll give you a clue to the ID as well. Now, I said all that, but here's what you got to do. Just get your smartphone out, download these new apps like Seek from iNaturalist, PlantSnap. Google has its own lens. I use them all the time now, and they are really good. <laughs> They're so good. And as AI gets going, it's only going to get more um, 
suitable to use our phones to help us with tree ID and we can all be an expert. That makes me feel a little uh, frustrated because I spent years learning it, but it really is a good thing that we all can be experts with tree ID. And then there's a couple online sites like the uh, Arbor Day Foundation, What Tree Is That is a good one. And trees.unl.edu also has all our native trees online so you can uh, confirm if you think you ID'd that tree properly. Okay, I'm gonna run through quickly uh, several species to highlight that we're just gonna really look at the key features that are shine in winter. You're not gonna uh, get a full day's worth of tree ID here, but we're gonna run through it pretty quickly and then talk about it as we wrap up. And again, a few more quotes, no winter lasts forever and no sp spring skips its return. Here's a backdrop picture, Gladitzia triacanthus in the winter. Uh, a tree that we don't think much of, right, in our landscape, and yet in the winter, look at that against a gray sky, and you can see a lot to behold there. Okay, a number one in my brain, coming from western Nebraska, thank God for the hackberry. It's a wonderful tree, and it's it almost shines more in the winter uh, than in uh, the summertime. If you get a low sun angle on that bark, that bumpy bark, that we call warty, uh, wartiness in the bark. It really, really shines, and especially in the winter. That middle picture is a picture of a tree I took out in western Nebraska 20 years ago, probably. And you get that bright blue sky and that low sun angle. And can you see on the left picture here the layering of those warty uh, uh, bark protrusions from that tree? So the rest of the bark was lost in between these protrusions but every year puts another layer on the rest of these bumps so that they build up over time. And if you look at it sideways, it's almost looking like you're looking down a canyon wall or something. It's really neat. I do love me some hackberry. <laughs> and it's uh, interesting because hackberry is so prominent, so easy to grow. It's actually overtaking some natural areas in the Great Plains where we're losing bur oaks and things. So we gotta be a little bit careful with its management. But we've had hackberries living in Nebraska for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. Hi. They've gone through all our climate shifts and they just laugh at it. So a couple other things to think of, show you on hackberry on the lower left are the seeds. Those black, bright black seeds are edible. The Native Americans worked them into a, a pemmican type of a food to help get them through the winter. On the middle of the upper right is what they call witch's brooms, which are real common. They're caused by a mite insect that deforms some of the little twigs and branches. Some trees are just loaded with these witch's brooms and it causes no problems, much like the nipple gall on the leaves in the summer. Don't worry about it, it won't hurt the hackberry. And then on the far right, do you see the twigs of the hackberry? They, uh, the buds are called two rank. That means they come out on the same plane and then these buds are also uh, called, uh, what, what do we call that when they're held tight against the stem? I've drawn a blank on the term for that, but they're turned upright, right up against the stem. That's really common or uh, prominent with hackberry and a good winter ID. Sycamore, who cannot like sycamore uh, in the winter with its bright, shiny bark in uh, mottled nature of grays, whites, browns, yellows, tans. They No two trees look alike. Some are ghostly white. Some are mostly brown and tan, and you get all forms in between. I will point out on the sycamore, too, if you look at the twigs, I have a mind that goes this way, but those look like little ice cream cones to me. They're very prominent. They're pokey, uh, very woody, and they're very prominent on a sycamore uh, in the winter when you look closely. The sycamore and the London plane tree are actually closely related. The London plane tree is a hybrid sycamore hybridized with the oriental plane tree, and it's been planted all across the northern hemisphere in our cities. Uh, we don't use it much in Nebraska, but it does exist here. And on the left, I showed you earlier, you can tell the difference between sycamore and plane tree just by the number of fruit balls that hang off on the little strand that are real prominent in the winter. So this is sycamore on the left. Uh, this is a sycamore tree on campus of the university. I just took this picture the other day. And then lower left is plane tree because they're uh, existing in pairs. 
Why you need to know that, I don't know, other than just to impress your friends and family, it's a cool thing to know. Our native or our state tree is the Eastern cottonwood. And wow, what a fabulous tree. <clears throat> we don't think about it much in the winter, right? But it's the tree with the most deeply furrowed bark that we have. You could lose a small child or a cat in the crevices of that bark if you're not careful. Stick your hand in there and you might retrieve something you're not expecting. It can be four to six inches deep. Some of that bark is really neat. The buds on, on um, the twigs of cottonwood are very prominent, upward pointing. They're the biggest buds we see in the winter almost, the vegetative buds. Uh, Bob could tell us a story too about how the honeybees frequent these buds in the late uh, winter, early spring to help uh, get a waxy coating to build up their hives. And then you might get catkins hanging off uh, the flower structure of a cottonwood. Who doesn't like some bur oak, the quintessential Great Plains tree? This is a picture from East Campus. I think a year ago I was able to get that. Uh, covered in snow. I love the billowing, widespreading nature of our bur oak. It's one of the few trees that could stand being out on the prairie, and part of its strategy was to get up and get out to tolerate that Great Plains wind. Wow, you know, bur oak, and they'll live forever, hundreds of years. They're coarse, uh, they're coarse, coarsely branched. They'll grow all kinds of shapes. Did any of you ever read the book Hounds of the Baskervilles, where they describe some really gnarly trees in there. Uh, a bur oak reminds me of that, and it's just kind of like cool. That would be cool in an old haunted uh, uh, cemetery or something. So I love some bur oak. Deeply furrowed bark, that was the way it withstood our prairie fires and could get adapted out here. You might run into bur oaks that have deep, uh, really widely winged young bark structure. Again, that's probably an adaptation to prairie fire uh, survival. Here on the lower middle, you'll see sometimes remnant acorns on the ground and then the oak leaves themselves. Some people curse oak leaves because it might take two seasons to fully break down in the compost. Man alive, this is nature's best compost and mulch. Just let it exist on the ground under your trees and it's a great hangout for all kinds of insects. The birds come along and shift uh, or seek under insects underneath there. And it's just great for wildlife. And then on the lower right is the bud up close of a bur oak. Did you ever look at that? Again, in all of the oaks, the buds are all bundled together right at the tip of the twig, uh, four to five little buds together. Bur oak. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake, Robert Frost. Doesn't that scene just kind of look inviting even on a cold snowy day? I'd love to trudge through there. Winter can be fantastic. Now, of course, this is what winter usually looks like. Here's a walnut. <laughs> the snow is all gone and spring's coming on finally. But this is black walnut. Walnut is another tree that really shines in the winter because it's bark. Once you see that bark and get it in your head, that brownish red rustic color deeply uh, pocketed bark is really neat and unique to uh, walnut. Much like the bur oak and some other tr trees, it has this really coarse architecture or outline. It's a coarse form and you can start to pick them out in the winter from a distance. And then if you look up close at the twigs, th this is where some fun stuff is going on with the walnut. If you look at uh, the leaf scar, when the leaves fall off, the petioles fall off, I see a monkey face in there. Do you see that monkey face in there? Plus it's fuzzy. And those two things together, if you're in the woods and there's tree of heaven around, you might confuse the two, but tree of heaven is a smooth twig and the walnut, it has this monkey face and this uh, fuzziness. And it also has a chambered pith if you cut that open. And then usually you'll find some remnants of the uh, walnut fruit hanging around underneath the tree. The squirrels have not opened a few of them and you can see the remnants there. So that'll give you an ID uh, clue. A couple hickories, these are both native to Nebraska. The shagbark hickory on the left and the bitternut hickory on the right. And there's a couple neat things about both of those. The shagbark hickory on the left, obviously, you can tell how it gets its name. 
its bark is shaggy. It comes off in strips as it matures. And you'll see this in our native Nebraska oak hickory woods. And sometimes a stone's throw array is this other hickory, the bitternut hickory. And you're like, what the heck is that with that uh, smooth bark that looks more like maybe a cantaloupe skin? That's the bitternut hickory. It doesn't do any peeling bark. The thing about the bitternut hickory to really help you with ID is it's the only thing with these long pointed sulfur yellow buds, that sulfur yellow color. I can't think of another tree with a bud like that. And then in the winter, you will find these remnant uh, husks and leftover seeds that the squirrels didn't eat underneath these trees, which will be another uh, ID clue. Here on the lower right is the seeds, the fruit of bitternut hickory. Its Latin name is Caria cordiformis. Cordiformis means heart-shaped fruit, and you can kind of see where that comes from. And then on the lower left, the shagbark hickory, and especially its cousin, the shellbark hickory, have much bigger nuts that are uh, almost golf ball size, and they're much more tasty, very edible. You don't find many seeds left on the ground from the squirrels because they love those nuts. These bitter nut hickories can persist on the ground under the tree because they're kind of a last food of resort for a lot of animals, thus the name bitter nut hickory. Kentucky coffee tree. Look at what a coffee tree looks like late in the day with a low sun angle and a bright yellow uh, sun shining on that tree bark on the left. This was in Lincoln uh, last winter. Look at that picture in the middle. The Kentucky coffee tree is our, probably our most naked, coarsely formed tree of all of our native trees. It really stands out in the winter, and, but we don't think about the bark always, and it has this peeliness to it. It almost looks to me like it was stuccoed on or maybe just applied like uh, 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 cornflakes or something pushed on the side of that trunk. So that's Kentucky coffee tree. It is native here, and one of the things that we, helps pick it out in our woodlands is when we see the seeds at the top of the tree. In this previous picture, this is on East Campus just the other day. The top of the tree, I could see all the seed pods hanging on, and so from a distance, I could more or less say, yep, that's Kentucky coffee tree. These are the seeds. They hang on through the winter, and they start to fall late winter, early spring. And then in the sun of the early spring, they'll open up and you'll get this gelatinous goo in the middle of those seeds. And that was actually highly nutritious to animals. And in our last ice age, uh, animals long ago extinct would eat these seeds with relish in the late winter. So uh, gomphotheres and mastodons and things like that that are long gone ate these seeds. These seeds are as hard as a rock. And they go all the way through the animal's gut and plop out the other end to be a new tree somewhere down the line. But look at how beautiful a big old Kentucky coffee tree is in the right landscape, in the right situation. They're ugly as sin. Uh, the first few years of their lives, they have no branches, but they are one of the most graceful and beautiful trees with age. The black locust is a tree that we don't give a lot of love to, but in the winter, you get to see how deeply creviced some of the bark can be on that. You can also see in this middle picture how sometimes the bark twists all the way up the trunk of a tree. And then be careful with black locust. Uh, those are some of the sharpest thorns on any tree we have. If you run into that at night or you try to rub, rub your hand up the side of that branch, you're going to be bleeding. And so that gives away black locust for sure. <clears throat> We're not gonna spend a lot of time on maple ID, but if you look at maples in the winter, remember what we talked about, they're paired buds, they're opposite each other on the, on the tree. And so often in our landscapes, if we have opposite buds and branching, it's usually gonna be a maple or an ash. Well, here are the common maples we have in our landscape. Sugar maple on the left, a sharp pointed bud, Norway maple next to it, a bright uh, brownish, almost purple bud and very big and fat. Small round red buds are the red maple, and then red stems, but more pointed buds are the silver maple. We can look at the bark of those trees too. Here on the far left is sugar maple. When you see a maturing sugar maple, to me, they always have this sootiness to them. It looks like their grayish blackish bark uh, was maybe in some polluted city or something, and they have a sooty nature to them. And that's very 
uh, typical of uh, sugar maple. Next to it is Norway maple, which more looks more like ash bark. Then we have the smooth bark, at least when the tree is young, of red maple. And then on the far right is this peely bark of silver maple, a maturing silver maple. It's pretty easy to pick out because of that strap-like peeling bark. Another one of my favorite trees, which we don't give much love to, but that's the box elder maple, Acer nagundo. A couple things to think about box elder maple. It has this waxy co uh, coating on the twigs, so it's a whitish waxiness in the winter, which is prominent. And then when the leaves come off of that tree, do you see back here on the twig, the uh, base of the leaf pedial wraps around completely around that twig? Well, when they fall off and you look at that sideways, I see a duck, a duck face or a duck bill looking back at me. So that's kind of neat, isn't it? And then on the lower left, a lot of the box elder maples hold their seeds all winter. And then look at this tree on the far right I took a picture of in Fort Collins a year ago. A big old box elder maple. I'm sorry, they are just cool. The bark is neat. Nobody wants them in their yard or their landscape, but see a big old box elder maple, and I'll show you a wonderful old tree. The black cherry, I mentioned to you the flaky bark of coffee tree a minute ago. Well, the black cherry is fairly similar, and it just looks to me, I've had this described to me like somebody, a maturing tree, looks like somebody burnt some cornflakes and just stuck it to the side of the tree. And that's just a really apt description of black cherry bark. So that really is a great identifier in our Eastern Nebraska native woods this time of year. But when you see the tree early in its life, it has cherry-like bark with these really prominent white striations. Those are called lenticels. And a lot of the cherries show this. That's where that trunk is exchanging gases with the atmosphere. So pretty important for the life of the tree but they're lost with maturity. And here's the twig on the right, a beautiful little twig, almost like sycamore-like uh, in the winter. The Eastern redbud is a Nebraska native, popular in our landscapes. What shines for the redbud in the winter is that brownish tan color of its bark as it matures. I really love that. It's a little bit shaggy of a bark as it matures, so you can start to pick redbuds out pretty easily just by bark. They sometimes hold their seeds all winter here on the lower left. And then when you see a small twig of a red bud against the sky, it's the tree with the most prominent zigzag pattern along with linden trees that really do that. That's a red bud. Here's ironwood, a very common Eastern Nebraska native in the Oak Hickory woodlands. It's almost too prevalent now because they're having to control its uh, aggressive nature in our eastern oak hickory woodlands because it runs amok, it's shade tolerant, and it can shade out our oaks and hickories. But a great tree for the landscape. It's got this um, peely bark, almost like a cedar. You see that on the left. You might see the hops-like fruits hanging on into early winter. The catkin male flowers hang off in groups of threes, and they're really neat to see. And then they're usually a multi-stem plant holding on to some of those leaves. And do you remember what we called that? Marcescent, marcescent leaves held by the ironwood. And in our native woods, that's a really good identifier of that tree. If you like birds and you wanna do landscaping for the birds, <clears throat> definitely plant some uh, crab apples or other fruiting plants. And there are so many now <clears throat> crab apples that will hold their fruits all winter. They're called persisting crab apples. And if you do that, things like prairie fire, Indian magic, uh, cultivars like that, they'll hold the fruit all winter. And then when the cedar wax wings come through next spring or late winter, they'll be roosting on your tree and you'll have this glorious uh, opportunity to see the cedar wax wing on its way through. So plant some crab apples. We don't think of fruit as an important ornament, but with many crab apples, they are well through winter. The bald cypress is a pretty easy to grow tree in eastern Nebraska, the eastern half of Nebraska, especially in wetlands. It's actually in the pine family, so it's more closely related to spruce and pines and evergreens, but it drops its needles in the fall. And when it does, it opens up that wonderful uh, strap-like bark that looks just so much like our other cedars that we have in our area. 
and it can be shiny shades of brown, orange, and cinnamon, a great, really great feature of that tree in the winter. And then you might see the male flower cones or the catkins that hang off in the winter. And then the female cones that developed the previous summer and fall, they often persist well into winter. These little round things are the cones. Those are the female fruits, the seeds that were pollinated by these male cones earlier in the year. That's bald cypress. The color of springtime is in the flowers. The color of winter is in the imagination. Okay, I got to move this along, people. We're way too long-winded, Justin. Pinus ponderosa, ponderosa pine, the most common native pine in Nebraska. Nebraska is home to its most eastern reach in the United States. Do you see that here? It grows as far out as in the, the sand hills of Custer County. And it's a great tree to use across Nebraska. The picture on the upper left is from my hometown in Kimball. Look at that row of uh, ponderosa pines. They were little when I was little, and now they're big old trees. In this picture on the lower right, I showed you earlier from Waverly, where I live now, what a great row of old ponderosa pines that the school thought needed to go away. So don't tell them I ragged on them today, but they deserve it. So, <laughs> ponderosa pine. Look at this scene from the Waverly Park a few years ago when we got hoarfrost. Hoarfrost happens when you have quite a bit of moisture in the air late in the day, and then you get overnight freezing and the uh, frost clings to anything that will uh, reach, and especially tree twigs or uh, evergreen needles. On the left is great big old ponderosa pines over 100 years old out in Kimball. They can become shade trees in time. And here's the difference in the bark between the two most common uh, pine trees we grow in eastern Nebraska, Austrian pine on the right and ponderosa pine on the middle. Ponderosa pine has that cinnamon orange bark. The uh, Austrian pine on the right is grayish and black, silver and black. Then if we look closer at the leaves and the cones and the buds, we see some other differences between Austrian pine here on the left Ponderosa pine on the right. Austrian pine needles are shorter and they only occur in pairs. Ponderosa pine needles are typically longer, especially our native Nebraska seed source. The Great Plains Ponderosa pines has needles that can be up to 10 or 12 inches long sometimes, and they occur in twos and threes. Then the cones have a difference, especially being the ponderosa pine has these sharp prickle tips to the cone scales. And then finally, if you look at the buds, the ponderosa pine buds are a little more elongated uh, and rounded at the tip, whereas the Austrian pine buds are almost triangular, almost uh, pointed. Spruce trees. Yep, when you think of a winter scene, a tree covered in snow, you're probably seeing spruce trees. Unfortunately, a lot of the spruce are struggling in eastern Nebraska, and we're really no longer promoting Colorado spruce. But Black Hill spruce, uh, white spruce, Norway spruce are still good choices for us. And in Western Nebraska, come on now, that Colorado spruce is fantastic. And in the winter, it really takes on a whole new sheen when it's covered in frost or snow, right? So it's not hard to like a spruce covered in snow and frost. If you want a little bit of a just quick ID comparison, here's the cones that fall off under the tree and you can see these in the winter and the spring to get an ID sense. So the uh, Black Hill spruce cone is only about an inch and a half long, the Colorado spruce three inches long, and then the Norway spruce about six inches long, big fat uh, cones. Those are the big differences. Concolor fir, a great tree to have in the landscape, one we don't use enough of. Again, another one from the Waverly Park frosted in snow a few years ago. Uh, Concolor fir has these long, upswept, flat needles, which are soft. They don't poke you like the spruce do. And then just remember that for fir trees, the cones point upward. They grow in the late summer and uh, fall, and then they disintegrate when they're dry, and they drop out of the tree. The seeds and the scales drop out like that, and you never find an intact cone unless a squirrel chewed it off. So you just don't see cones under fir trees. Did we see that previous quote by Oscar Wilde? Wisdom comes with winters, they say. I believe it. 
Douglas fir is not a true fir, but it does have soft, flat needles with short stalks, uh, so similar to a fir, but it has a cone that grows and points down. It comes off intact, and that cone has this turkey foot bracked in it. Somebody describes it to, to them looking like a tail, a mouse tail coming out between the scales of the cone. No other cone does that for us. And I, I'm here to tell you that we have Douglas firs doing well all across Nebraska. You run into great specimens all the time, and yet the tree hardly gets planted. So it's proven itself if you have the right seed source, we should plant more Douglas fir, less Colorado spruce and more Douglas fir. You think uh, winter will never end, and then when you don't expect it, when you have almost forgotten it, warmth comes in a different light, says Wendell Berry. And boy, that's a great quote for uh, this time of year. And this picture I'm wrapping up with just shows you uh, that even a Siberian elk, <laughs> which is so hard to like, and most of these trees are gone now. These, this is in the Waverly Cemetery. <clears throat> they come apart in storms these last few years, and we had to take most of them out. But look at what that hoarfrost does on just about any tree, and even a Siberian elm shines in winter. So this is the last slide. We will uh, we wrapped up. Oh, twelve forty eight. A little longer than I wanted to. But what we're going to do now is we're going to throw up the link for any of those that want to get CEUs for NAA or ISA. And then also, if anybody wants to chime in on trees that they're fascinated with in winter and why, I'd sure love to hear that. We can have a conversation here for about 10 minutes. We'll throw up this form and we'll give you about 10 or 15 minutes to fill it out if you want to get ISA CEUs. So I'll stop sharing that screen. Yeah, I, I just put that form in the chat for everyone uh, for ISA, NAA, or SAF credits. Um, you can fill out that form. You can also use that to give some feedback on the webinar itself, even if you don't need any CEUs. So uh, feel free to fill that out. And uh, Justin and I will stick around in case you have any uh, questions on the form, but it's pretty straightforward. Give us your information, uh, plug in your numbers for the appropriate organizations, and we will uh, forward that information on to uh, those entities from there um, a little after the, the session's over. So, you know, Justin, I gotta say, no talk about winter tree ID and appreciation is complete without talking about witch hazel. All and right, here, brother. Here, here at Douglas County Extension, we have a beautiful common witch hazel in the, in the courtyard blooming right now. Um, you know, you mentioned how we don't think about flowers this time of year, but boy, that is just an oddball that's really easy to appreciate this time of year. <laughs> wow, it's taking on some cold there. In the, uh, well, the courtyard's kind of a little microclimate, I think, that helps a little bit. Yeah, good, good one, Graham. That reminds me, yeah, I noticed in the Waverly Park last November, we had the witch hazels blooming, but I think they're toasted by now. But yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it might be about done over here as well, but um, it was blooming a little uh, a little later than I remember in previous years. I think because we had such a a mild, uh, you know, entrance into winter time. Normally, we kind of dive into cold temps earlier, and it kind of probably triggers that tree to start thinking about blooming earlier than it usually or later than it normally does. And then on the other end of winter, we'll be able to get the vernal witch hazel, which blooms in sometimes in February. Yeah. It's nice and fragrant. And I, I used to have one in my backyard and I'd come out in early March and go, whoa, what's that smell? And that was the vernal witch hazel saying, winter's about over. You've made it. So. Yeah. And it gets to be kind of an academic argument about whether Cornus moss, the Cornelian cherry dogwood, is the first to bloom, or depending on your definition, that vernal witch hazel is certainly earlier, but uh, is it the last to bloom or the first to bloom? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. I wonder if anybody online has a favorite tree. Bruce Hoffman, you're there. I don't have, I don't know about a favorite tree, but uh, I was wondering if anyone else across the state had noticed a lot of honey locusts this winter with the leaves still on them. And then Specifically here in my area, we had a lot of heat and scorch later on. The lindens looked horrible towards the end of the year. Um, 
uh, it's the southwest side that was the most affected by heat. You know, if they're over pavement or something, those leaves are still on the honey locust. It's just I've never seen it before. Kind of an odd phenomenon. And and uh, wondered if you or Graham or Greg, Bob, yes. maybe had an explanation for that. Yeah, I do. I can tell you this, uh, Bruce, we, at least here in eastern Nebraska, the frost came out. We were green right up until... Uh, late October, and then we got a really pretty good quick snap of cold, and quite a few trees here got their leaves frosted on, like sycamore for sure did, and a few others. So that could be part of it, but I don't, I don't know specifically on honey locust. Yeah, there's kind of a natural desiccation process that leaves go through when they're on deciduous trees, and uh, I think sometimes when we have uh, extreme temperature changes, that doesn't allow the tree time to um to go through that that process of the tree sort of dropping leaves the way it normally does and so they can sort of dry up and die on the tree before they have a chance for the you know the leaf petiole to actually let go that's my guess i know that's it at least partially based on fact <laughs> yeah no i think you're right you can always often pick pick out trees that have had animal chewing because there's leaves hanging on in the winter and it disrupted the growth of that particular branch or stem. Yep. Bob, I'm glad you shared that bit about uh, honeybees and uh, cottonwood buds. I forget the whole story there, but is there a, something on that bud that they're going after? Yeah, the, the, the cottonwood, you know, the cottonwood and its medicinal benefits goes back centuries and all over the world, not just our popular species. But uh, honeybees, of course, were used to uh, poplars over in Europe before we brought them over here. But now they, they hit our native cottonwood and actually can do damage to the buds, according to some. But it's like a sticky resin that if you've noticed a cottonwood you know, dropping its branches in late winter, early spring storm, you see those buds are elongated and like swollen. And if you've ever touched them, they're sticky to the touch. And I use my nose a lot in identifying things too. But if you smell it, it has a very, oh, I don't know, like a lotion type scent to it. And it's been used for centuries as a product called Balm of Gilead. And we can make our own uh, cottonwood bud salve for healing purposes. It has antibacterial, antimicrobial, antifungal agents. So the bees will collect this when they're emerging from their hive and line their hive with it. Um, in fact, that article I, I put in there, they talk about if a mouse crawls into a beehive and, and dies in there, the bees will wall off that mouse body with that propolis, it's called, and that sticky resin huh. uh, to keep any bacteria and fungi from that decaying mouse from... Uh, causing damage to the hive. So it's a pretty amazing thing. And the site I put up there, man, if you want to fall into a rabbit's hole, look up medicinal benefits of, of cottonwood. And right. uh, so it's not just a, a pretty face and pretty buds in the wintertime. It's got, it's got something for us. Right on brother. Thanks. Hey, Justin, we have a question in the um, chat here. Somebody said that they would like to understand the differences in evergreen classification. So I don't know if you can do that really quickly or if we want to put that down as another topic sometime. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what they're asking, but evergreen classification or conifers, uh, the, they broadly classify conifers together. So it would include things like the bald cypress, but also cedars and junipers, pines, spruce, and fir. And then there's other things like false cypress and um, arborvita. Uh, mostly these things are evergreens, but um, in Nebraska, we probably just lump them into about three broad categories, pines, fir, spruce, or excuse me, four, and then juniper, cedar. And then, of course, here in eastern Nebraska, we can grow bald cypress. So uh, we can also grow uh, arborvita. Uh, we don't promote it a lot, but uh, does that answer some of those questions? Yeah, I bet part of it comes down to, you know, we have this distinction between deciduous and evergreen, right? Or yeah. uh, deciduous and conifer and then evergreen. Or, and, and so you, you can have broadleaf evergreens. Right. right? Uh, you think about some of our euonymus, uh, mo most of the state, we can't grow uh, Mahonia, but 
uh, there are plants like that that are broad leaved and would look to be yep. deciduous, but actually do hold those leaves on. Boxwood and holly. Time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that can get kind of strange. And then as Justin just mentioned, we do have those deciduous conifers like bald cypress and larch that, uh, you know, they look like spruce. And I think sometimes they're cut down on accident. People think it's a dead spruce, but it's just a bald cypress that drops its needles every year. Yeah, no, Omaha especially is home to a lot of really cool old uh, large trees. So both types can be grown here. Yep. So um, please, if you're filling out that CEU form, just stick around if, if, so that you can let us know if there's any trouble. But like I said, it's it's pretty straightforward. So uh, we'll be submitting that, that sheet uh, later this afternoon. Uh, Justin and Graham and Bob. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm disappointed in you guys that you never mentioned about our Siberian elms. I mean, that's a growing tree. It's hardy. Yeah. Any comments on that? I well, I wrapped up. I think it's really underestimated. Yeah, you got a lot of nice ones there, right on the uh, trailhead, and we got a beautiful group uh, batch going, and they're green, yeah. and the birds love it. I'm a little disappointed you haven't really touched yeah, on I that. Like well, Graham's pretty good at finding value in a lot of these trees that I kind of detest, like Siberian elm. But you're you're right, Dean. There is value in those trees, even if it's hard to swallow sometimes. <laughs> and, and if and if they're not rotten, it is beautiful wood uh, to use for uh, furniture and and things like that. So I hear you there, Dean. My problem is I come from Kimball County, where all the Siberian elms are half dead. And that's yeah. the vision in my brain all the time. And for the record, I just want everybody to know I'm just kidding here. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, <That's good. laughs> hey, you know me, Dean. Jesus. I eat anything. And get this, if you, uh, you, if you want to take it out on the Siberian elms, uh -huh. the little seeds, when they're developing in clusters on the tips of the branches, when they're immature, before they mature and turn brown, they're quite tasty. Now, I wouldn't go out there and harvest a meal of them, but uh, look it up, Siberian elm uh, edible seeds. Uh, you know, it's nice to bright green flavor. And if you're eating the seeds, then you won't have any seedlings, you see. Do they taste <laughs> like chicken? Do they taste like chicken? Taste like or? chicken. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you guys. Well, and, and same same for redbud, too. It's a very narrow window before they get real stringy. And Yeah. But uh, when those pods are still kind of green and tender and small, uh, boy, they're not a whole lot different than uh, a lot of the other peas that you might buy at the grocery store. Trick somebody, Graham, and serve them up some sautéed red bud and say, how'd you like your snow peas? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, they're, they're and, a little and woody. The flower, and the flowers make food gorgeous and don't taste like a whole lot, but... Yeah, they're fun to still eat in front of people to make them nervous. Yeah. I'm just well, a better person since I've known you guys. Thank you. Oh, dang. <laughs> Thank I'm you. It's what made my day. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And it's only Friday. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin, so much. That was a lot of amazing information. Now, if I can just retain even just 1% of it, I will be ahead of the game. But that <laughs> that's that was great stuff. So thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Everyone else, thank you so much for coming. Um, I did have one oversight in that I forgot to introduce Hannah. Like who forgets to introduce their boss? That would be me. So Hannah Pinio is our executive director of Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. She's here, there she is. So sorry, Hannah. <laughs> Luckily, most people know who you are already. So we're good. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, Nebraska, plantnebraska.org backslash plant dash talks if you need to register for upcoming um, talks in January and February. And that's it. Did we get all the CEUs, Graham? Are we ready to shut down? <laughs>